Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Everton show. As you can see, myself and Ian Snowden have swapped our usual recording space at USM Finch Farm for one of the most iconic sporting venues on the planet, you could say, Aintree Racecourse, the home of the Grand National this weekend. It's a fabulous place, Lord, isn't it? Absolutely fantastic. I've been here several occasions, uh, especially on Grand National Day as well. Um, many years when we used to play early morning kickoffs and then come to the game as well. So. Uh, yeah, I've seen it all here. It's fantastic. It's one of the best sporting occasions ever. Did you have to win the game to be allowed to go to the National or Not was really. it just a given anyway? Yeah, it was a given anyway, but it was always better when you actually won and then you could celebrate anyway. We were on the champagne regular, to be quite <laughs> honest. A little bit later on in the show, you'll be under a bit of pressure because I gave the viewers one for Arthur last year, tipped mm. the winner of the National, so it's your turn this year. Do you generally have a bit of luck on the National? Not too bad. I've probably picked three out. I, I think you need you need more than one horse. Uh, I tend to pick three out, but I've got one that I really fancy. I'll tell you later on in the uh, in the show. But I've got one that I think will go really close. Well, another massive sporting occasion, of course, in this neck of the woods is the Merseyside Derby. Nil nil last weekend. Mm. Just about right. <sighs> we not say, not including it, the chances at the end. Yeah, we had we had two great opportunities at the end. Uh, I thought the first 10 or 15 minutes we did okay and the last 10 or 15 minutes in, in between that I didn't think no side deserved to win it really. Uh, it weren't a great spectacle, weren't a great derby but we could have been celebrating at the end. You made Michael Keane man of the match. Mm. I thought he played very well. I thought the two centre-backs, uh, both Phil Jagielka and, and Michael Keane were, were outstanding on the day but I just thought Michael is getting back to what I know we were expecting when he signed for the club and I thought he I thought he was commanding, I thought he won every header, every tackle he went for, he seemed to win, so uh, yeah, I thought he deserved it as well. Is Michael benefiting from a settled back four? Yeah, I think he is, I think he's helped, he's been helped by Phil Jagielka as well, the experience, he, he'll be talking to him all the way through, but you can see him now starting to grow in confidence himself and uh, he's an England international, he really is and he he wants to go to uh, the World Cup, he's got to perform these last uh, remaining few games as well. So uh, yeah, we've, we've seen the better, the, the best, sorry, of uh, Michael King in recent weeks. Phil Jagielka after the game was quick to praise Morgan Schneiderlin, mm. who's been through a difficult time this season, but nobody completed more passes during the Merseyside derby than Morgan Schneider and I thought he did well. I was delighted for him, I thought he protected our back four well, I thought he won most of his tackles, got plenty of blocks in and uh, used the ball well as he's... Uh, passing said so uh, yeah I would be like it again for, for Morgan uh, he has been under a little bit of scrutiny lately uh, but he come through the derby very well. We're at Aintree Racecourse and as you can see behind us it's quite deserted at the moment that will not be the case over the weekend but while it's quiet Snods and I decided to have a quick look around. Snodge, you and I have just walked down the course here at Aintree from the finishing post to here, which is one of the most iconic fences of the lot. It certainly is. Uh, people go on about Beecher's Brook, uh, but the, for me, the chair, it's right in front of the main stands as well. Uh, this is a, a big open ditch that uh, a lot of horses fail to get over it as it is. You can see uh, it's hell of one hell of a fence. It really is. So uh, Standing this close really gives you a perspective. I think it's astonishing. It is, and uh, the bravery of the jockeys, the horses, uh, it's quite incredible uh, to get round this, this course twice. Well, this is one of the biggest fences on the entry race course. Let's now go and have a look at the weighing room where the jockeys will get ready to tackle the big event. are in the inner sanctum now here at Aintree. This is the weighing room, the jockey's changing room, and we're by the peg of the iconic AP McCoy who won the race in 2010, and I would imagine Snods is one of your favourite jockeys. Oh, without a doubt. Um, you always knew. Uh, I've met him on several occasions, AP. I had good chats with him. Uh, likes his golf as well, but uh, what a jockey. Whatever horse he was on, whether it was in a, a selling race, or the Grand National entry, you knew you'd get 100% commitment out of AP McCoy. That's why he was probably the, the best uh, jockey of all time. It must be unbelievable to walk back in here as the winner of the entry Grand National. There'll be a few celebrations, uh, I've no doubt, in the in the, in the the weighing room here amongst the jockeys, but uh, if you back the winner outside as well, 
there's a bit of champagne flying out for the punters as well. So all in all, it's a fantastic, fantastic occasion. Not only the Saturday, the Grand National, but the Thursday and Friday as well. And uh, it's, it's a great venue, absolutely. It's, I love it. I, I could stay here all day. I really could. It's terrific, isn't it, to have a little look behind the scenes here at Aintree? It's brilliant because when you come, you're just either in a box or outside. <laughs> you don't really see a lot, but uh, when you see behind the scenes where the jockeys go, etc. And uh, I remember coming regularly uh, with Saint. We did the Saint and Snod show from here uh, on numerous occasions and we interviewed jockeys and uh, interviewed behind the scenes, people behind the scenes and uh, it, 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 it was fantastic and me and Saint used to really look forward to that. This, this Grand National Day, because it is something else. Mm. The atmosphere, just the atmosphere, the buzz about it. When the tape goes up for the Grand National, wow, it's one of the best best rows in, in, in the world, really, it is. And, uh, I think local people sometimes take it for granted because it's on our doorstep, but this is a global, global event. I know my son, uh, Reese came last year with three of his pals from Donny and he went, wow, I need to get my ticket. <laughs> He'd only, he spoke to me on the night, he went, I'm gonna get my ticket for next year. <laughs> he said, I've, I've never known anything like it. He absolutely loved it, but so do people from all over. But I think, I think Liverpool people are proud uh, that the Grand National is in Liverpool. It's one of the most famous races. It's one of the most populated races. There's 40 odd horses. But only one winner. Over, is, to, over to you, Snods. Yeah, there is only one winner, and I'm going for a Gordon Elliott horse. Uh, it's called Tiger Roll. Uh, he had a great Cheltenham. Uh, I don't know my stuff, uh, <laughs> to be honest, on, on the horses. But uh, yeah, he had a great Cheltenham. Uh, lots of winners over the uh, four day period. So uh, I'm going for him in the big one. It's called Tiger Roll, ridden by David Russell. And I think that's going to be the the winner of the Grand National on Saturday. What does it need to win a Grand National? It needs an horse that can, because I think the conditions will be quite soft as well. We've had plenty of rain over, over this week, and uh, yeah, it's going to take a, a lot of stamina. An horse that can get the distance, but more importantly, can jump. Uh, that's the name of the game: jump, steeple chasing. So uh, yeah, this this horse can. It's uh, it's got plenty about it, and I'm telling you, Daz, listen to me, it will be there and there about us. <laughs> You've just cost hundreds of thousands of Evertonians, an absolute fortune. Yeah. Well, one of the most looked forward to days on the calendar down at USM Finch Farm is when the young boys of the academy get the opportunity to train with the first team. Early this week, Sam Allardyce took his first team squad of players across for what we call Academy Day. One of the best days in our programme, opportunity for the under 6 to 11s to train with the first team. That's, that's the name of the game, it's for, it's for us to try and get players down to the first team end. And um, days like today reiterate that success when we see players who have been at our end come all the way through and then come back down as first team players. They are living, reading inspiration to our current co-host and players. Snod, you've been at Finch Farm for these academy days and they're, they're fantastic aren't they? Brilliant. The players look forward to it. Uh, we know the young kids do, uh, they get excited but uh, the players do. I, I remember Sylvan Diston uh, when he was at the club he absolutely loved going and, and sharing a five-a-side game or a red tennis game with the kids but and I think it's so important uh, that, the, that the kids interact with the first team as well. Uh, some of them are their heroes so uh, yeah it's a, it's a fantastic day for, for, for both first team and the academy kids. It's one of the real advantages of being at Finch Farm, isn't it, and having everybody under one roof. Yeah, because you see, even even the parents of the young kids are looking to see if they can see any of the first team around Finch Farm, so they, they get excited as well. But to have their kids actually training with Wayne Rooney's, your Leighton Baines, your Phil Jagielka's, your Pickford, it must be fantastic. The likes of Benny Beningamy and John Joe Kenny, their picture is on the wall at USM mm. Finch Farm on the other side of it. They've been there this week as part of the first team squad, but they've been on the academy side of it as starstruck kids. And it just shows to, the, to these kids that are in the academy what they can do, what, where they can progress to. Because, uh, yeah, the two you have mentioned, uh, Benny and John Joe, uh, are having fantastic careers at Everton Football Club. Uh, Benny came on in the Merseyside derby. John Joe's played a, a, a good few games when Seamus was out as well. So, yeah, it's great to see that um, progression from academy to first team, that's what the goal got to inspire to. Is it good for the coaches as well? Because you know all the coaches personally. Mm. 
they put an awful lot of hard work in. So it's nice for them to have a day like that as well. It is. That's that's why they're there to see to see young academy kids progress to the first team. They give them their knowledge, the coaching knowledge as well. But yeah, the, you can see the coaches smiling and enjoying the day as much as as much as all the players that are involved. So uh, it's just a fantastic day for everybody. That's just about it for part one of this week's Everton show. Don't go too far away though, because after this short break, we will be reuniting Sam Allardyce with a current employee at Finch Farm, who he released as a young teenager when he was a youth coach at Preston North End. Don't miss that one. Welcome back to part two of this week's Everton show. Myself and Ian Snowden are here at Aintree Racecourse. Now back at USM Finch Farm, not many Evertonians will be overly familiar with the name Danny Webb. He's the hard-working kit man at the Everton Academy. But when he was a teenager, he had hopes and dreams of becoming a professional footballer. He was in the youth team at Preston North End. That was until the youth coach of Preston North End let him go. That youth coach was Sam Allardyce. We reunited the pair earlier this week, and this is what happened when Sam met Dan. Obviously, it took me 25 years to catch up with the boss. And he got me in a room at Deepdale, and he said, unfortunately, Instead of saying him, he said, unfortunately, John Beck doesn't fancy you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I, I, said, <laughs> I said, <laughs> so I've, walked out, I've walked out calling John Beck fit to burn and, and I've never said a bad word against the Gaffer. You know, it was fantastic at the time for me to, to, to be playing, especially under Sam, obviously. Um, you know, he, he, he learnt us a lot. He, he, he knew the score. He, he spoke very highly of, of like, he used to, well, in fact, what it was, one of his things he used to say to us, Gaffer, was go and watch the Italian football on that's the right. Sunday. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, it was free as well, wasn't it? That's it was, why yeah. I said it. You yeah. didn't have to pay for it, like you mean. So I, I it was dad, particularly sorry, popular then, you know. Gaffer. It was. I used to have my dad on the roof with his umbrella, putting his, trying to get the satellite signal. So it was free. Had the boss said, yeah, it was all free. But he made us go home and watch the Italian football of a Sunday. And um, again, because the gaffer's so knowledgeable, he, he made us go home and we took notes on that and that sort of put onto our team that we were playing with on, on a on a Sunday. He was obviously a man you listened to then, even all the way back then. Very much so. Until he chased me. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't catch you though. Not then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, you know, we used to hang on all his every word he said, uh, you know, all the young players. We had some good young players at, at we Preston. Did. We did. And um, obviously the boss's knowledge was, was second to none. And, you know, it's even the lads who went on. So we had uh, Kilbarn Gaffer, didn't we? And we did. David Lucas. Yeah, McClellan. McClellan midfield player, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, you know what I mean? We had some, so, so they some lads that went on then, yeah. They worked under the boss and they obviously took whatever he spoke about and went on had better careers than me. Sounds like it was a really important time in your transition from playing to management because you'd had the spell over in Ireland, but then you had that time working with the young lads at Preston before going on to Blackpool, didn't you? Yeah, and I was very happy with that at the moment. I didn't, you know, as long as I was in football, that was fine by me, like I mean. And then I ended up getting the call because fortunately Les Chapman, who's my big mate, got got sacked and I got put in charge. Um, as caretaker manager, so I had to leave that role for a while uh, and then go back to youth team coach again. But, you know, in the end, the calling was always a manager for me, but uh, that experience of uh, Preston North End and the, the experience of managing young teams, you know, helped you along the way for me, helped, helped me become a better, a better coach, a better manager and a better person to, to deal with, in the end, what were senior players. All I've done is, is have the greatest greatest life I could have possibly wished for after I left school. So the worst time of my life was school. So the best time of my life was after it. And that the too many people can say that, you know, but but in the end I was the teacher and I hope I passed a lot of good things on to a lot of lot of players, both both young young and uh, in in the teens, in the in the first team and, and even when they get older, there's always something you can learn. That was just a bit of fun down at USM. I think Danny Webb waited a long time for an explanation. <laughs> Did you ever come across any coaches later in your career when you'd made it who'd let you go as a kid? Released as a kid? That's <laughs> behave yourself. Never been released. <laughs> I tell a lie, I got a free transfer from Everton. Joe Royal uh, let me go to uh, to and all you've the, met him once a show. Yeah, I met Big Joe and asked him why. And he's still not giving me the reason yet. <laughs> so, uh, but no, it's, uh, it's brilliant for Danny. But I've seen Danny play as well. I can understand why Big Sam released him as well, to be honest. <laughs> no arguments from you on No, that, not so. at all. There must have been lots of coaches along the way, though, who, who helped you progress. Yeah, they, they actually were. Colin Harvey, for instance, I thought he was an outstanding coach, but uh, in my 
uh, younger career when I was 16 getting in the Doncaster first team obviously the manager uh, was the late great Billy Bremner uh, who did all his coaching and his management he, he had a coach but he used to do it all Bremner uh, as old managers used to do and uh, I owe so much to him uh, from my from getting in the first team at 16 to making me captain at 18 at Doncaster were a big big thing then so that was an incredible decision for a manager to make wasn't yeah it, it? was a yeah. young boy a captaincy at 18 at that level with so many I would imagine hard and pros in the yeah they were it, we were third and fourth division then uh, all third and fourth division and there were a lot of uh, very senior pros my brother were three years younger than, uh, older than me sorry and he was in the team so yeah I think he, he saw a bit of steel in me a bit of aggression and a, a voice uh, I weren't scared to raise my voice at uh, 18 year old, so uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, I'm not saying he, he made the right decision at 18 because it did take a lot. Uh, mm. it, it really did. I had to, I had to take it all, all in at once uh, at 18, but I had to do loads of radio interviews as well at that time. So it made me grow up very, very quickly. Swansea City for the first team this weekend, Snods. What are you expecting there? I'm expecting a difficult game. They've certainly improved under the uh, the new manager, which I found really a little bit strange. A lot because of people did, didn't yeah, they? he'd not done brilliantly in these latest year with Sheffield Wednesday. They were kind of halfway uh, mid tableish, and and then he got the Swansea job in the Premier League. So uh, I'm quite quite surprised, but I think he's got the players playing for them. They've got a smile on the face, and uh, it'd be a difficult game. But I think it's one of them games that I think Everton should should not be scared of going down there and, and coming back with three points. I'm expecting three points from there, sadly. Whenever you and I do the commentary, we always look at the two team sheets when they're passed to us mm. and who would you take from the opposition. And with all due respect to Swansea, and Carlos Carver has done a great job there, he has turned things around. There aren't many of anything you take, are there? We got their best player, Gilfie Sigurdsson, I believe. Uh, and, and, and look at them and, uh, yeah, there isn't, there isn't a, any players for me that I would put in, put in Everton's team. So. Why shouldn't we go down there? Why shouldn't we go and express ourselves and, and come back with three points? As I said, I'm expecting a victory down there. Five games to go this season. It's been a topsy-turvy campaign for Everton, but one of the big plus points has been the form of Jordan Pickford. This is his take on the trip to South Wales. Um, coming off a good result on Saturday, and uh, our way form has picked up recently, so now we've got to go and get as many wins as we can in the last five games. and. They're all five winnable games, so why not go and win five? But like you say, it's sort of Swansea. We take each game out as it comes, and it'll be a tough test because they're struggling down there, and they'll be fighting for their lives. So we've just got to be ready to come for it. How important to match the intensity? Because like you say, Swansea are going to be really up for this, aren't they? Yeah, um, we we just need to do what we can do, and hopefully that's enough to beat Swansea. And we've got the ability and throughout the squad to to win. Having spoken for so long about getting the away win, having got it at Stoke now, what will that do for your confidence going away from home for the first time again? Yeah, we, we, we know it was, it was just getting a couple of things to come together and we, we knew um, getting one away win is going to be crucial for us and to get it at Stoke, it's probably one of the worst places to go to get a result in the Premier League and uh, to get that result was massive and now we can build on that. Just on your season as a whole, the fans have really taken to you. On a personal level, it's been very positive, hasn't it? Yeah, um, I always give me 100% each game and as a, as a lad growing up wanting to be a footballer, you, you've got to enjoy playing football and as long as you give your best, that's all you can do and I like, I like to interact with the fans and um, that's how I get, ho hopefully get the good relationship with them. Five games to go, Snods. We're nearly there and it's been a good debut season at the football club for Jordan Pickford. I think he's been a great signing, if I'm to be honest. I think uh, he's a young lad. Uh, he's got bags and bags of potential. For me... I hope he starts in the World Cup. Uh, That's a double-edged sword, isn't it, for Everton? It is, yeah. Because you always tend to think, don't get injured mm -hmm. uh, during during the competition for any outfield player, keeper or what. But I, I just think, since he arrived at the club, he's been he's become a big part of the club. He, he, he's great around the dressing rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, he's great at Finch Farm. And uh, he's a likeable character. And he, he's a winner. That's what I like in him most. He's a winner. When, when shots come in at him and he saves them, he has a go, no matter if it's Wayne Rooney, Phil Jaggy, Elka Leighton, Baines, or any of the young lads, he's always first to have a moan at him. And, uh, do you like his temperament as well? Yeah, do I do. I do. Uh, he, he, he's great. He takes everything in his stride. And uh, in the Derby game, he's, pr he's produced another couple of great saves. And uh, nothing's too, no game's too big for him. And uh, I think he's been a terrific, terrific signing. Is he your player of the season? 
I don't like making him a keeper, the player of the year, but I think he is. I think uh, some, consistent yeah, there. some of his performances have been outstanding, some of his saves. Yeah, you can count in the mistakes on one hand that he's made this season. So for me, I think he's a, he's a definite front runner. What about the other end? What's been your goal of the season? Well, there's two stand out for me. Uh, Gilfie Sigurdsson in, in the Europa Cup and uh, Wayne Rooney's against West Ham. And if I'm perfectly honest, two fantastic goals. I've never even had a shot like any of them two, but uh, Wayne's for me. The way he came back to him and the way he struck it uh, was absolutely perfect. I, I know the few might go for, uh, for Gilfie, but for me, Wayne's technique on that one was outstanding. And to complete a hat-trick. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, him coming back to Everton, scoring an hat-trick and a goal like that just caps it all for me. So that's your player of the season, your goal of the season. Just remind everybody who to avoid in the Grand National. Tiger Roll, <laughs> don't avoid it everybody. I'm telling you, Tiger Roll, Gordon Elliott, David Russell riding. I'm sure Tiger Roll's gonna win the National. Tiger Roll is not tip. Gasline Boy is my tip, and I won it last year. And that's just about it for this week's Everton show. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here at Aintree Racecourse. Good luck with whatever you bet on, and let's hope we can celebrate with the Grand National win and three points at Swansea. Do join us next week. You've been watching The Everton Show on YouTube. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm sure you have. Don't forget to subscribe and that way you can catch every single future episode.